Chapter 22 If only we could figure out the magic of the boat, Tony whispered as they sat floating in the darkness. Adam Hibbs had tried to tell me about it before he died, Q spoke up. He said something about the mind. Maybe what he was trying to tell me was that our thoughts have something to do with the power of the boat. You know, we were all talking and thinking about the Revolutionary War when we first saw that boat, Tony added. That's right, we were, Matt agreed. And Katie was thinking about home when she got back in the boat to leave. We may never figure it all out, but I think we've unraveled an important thread, Q remarked, trying to sound like his hero Sherlock Holmes. All I know is it sure feels good to be warm again, Matt sighed, dipping his hand into the warm lake water. I'd almost swear we were back on Levi Lake. This may be the right lake, but is it the right year, Tony wondered as he squinted into the darkness. Matt's hand skimmed along the water surface, when suddenly he felt something float over his fingers. He jerked his hand away from it, thinking that it might be a fish. When he was finally able to make it out in the misty darkness, he realized that what was floating in the water was a piece of paper. Quickly, he bent over the side of the boat and scooped it up onto the floor of the boat. What is it, Matt Hooter asked, leaning over to see what it was. All the other members of the club did the same. I don't know, Matt whispered. Let's just hope that it's not a piece of continental currency, Q said. That would mean we're still stuck in the 18th century. Maybe it's some kind of secret message that we were meant to find, Tony suggested. Like a map for time travel, Hooter added. As everyone sat huddled together, trying to see the paper, the first streaks of early morning light peeked over the horizon. Hooter, Matt called with a grin. Do you think they had potato chip bags in the 18th century? Everyone laughed with relief as Matt held up the soggy potato chip bag. As the mist slowly lifted, the golden sun rose in the east. Everyone looked out across the lake to find Tony's house nestled safely in the trees, just the way it was before they left. We're back! We're back! Matt cried as everyone joined in the merry chorus of laughter and cheers. Look, our tent is still up, Hooter exclaimed. From the looks of the light, I'd say it's early morning, Q said, adjusting the glasses on his nose. I wonder if my parents went off the deep end worrying about us, Tony added. I'm surprised they aren't out here with divers and helicopters looking for our bodies. From all that I've read about time travel in my science fiction books, Q said, it appears that a person traveling through time can experience days, weeks, and even years, and then return home to find he's only been gone a few hours. That's great, Matt decided. Maybe no one knows about our trip. Can you imagine what our parents would do to us if they found out where we were? What about Katie, Matt Hooter whispered. Katie stared up at Matt. Matt looked down at his little sister. You know, Katie, you got yourself into some big trouble on this trip, he said sternly. And if mom and dad were to find out about it, they would never let you hang out with the club again. But I don't see any reason why they have to find out. Do you? Katie's red curls shook as she slowly turned her head from side to side. You won't tell, will you, Matt? She asked in a little voice. No, Katie, I won't tell, Matt smiled. And Q and Toady and Hooter won't tell either. Will you, Matt asked. No, they all said at once. And you know, Katie, Matt continued, even though you got into a bunch of trouble, you weren't as big a pain as I thought you'd be. Katie grinned as her brother reached over and gave one of her curls a gentle yank. Matt's right, Tony said. We've all got to keep this a secret. I could just see my father's face if I told him that I spent the night with George Washington's troops. He'd probably make me go to therapy or something. Then it's settled, Matt grinned. We're all sworn to secrecy. We can hide the boat in some bushes and no one will know. Will have to know about it. You better not go home wearing those, Q said, pointing down to the old shoes that Mr. Hornby had given to Matt. Matt nodded. I almost forgot about them. My dad is going to have a fit when he finds out that I lost my new sneakers. Just don't try and explain how you lost them, Tony laughed. Why don't you just throw these shoes in the lake, he suggested. Matt looked down at the old worn shoes and smiled on remembering Mrs. Hornby's awkward last-minute display of kindness. No, I don't think I'll ever throw them away, he said, pulling the old shoes off. We can hide them with the boat. And Katie, you better take off those socks. We'll keep them with the shoes. I don't want to, Katie frowned. You have to, Matt said firmly. We'll all get into major trouble if you don't. Katie reluctantly took off the socks and handed them to Matt, who sat waiting with his hand out. He folded the socks up and placed them inside one of the old shoes that were on the floor of the boat. Land ho! Hooter, Hooter cried as the boat slowly drifted to shore. Boy, it sure is good to be back home in the 20th century. Matt sighed, looking over to a row of brown and green condominiums that stood between the trees. Suddenly, he found himself remembering his ride through the woods on Blackjack. 
He remembered just how beautiful the woods were and how unspoiled the landscape was. I'll miss the 18th century in a way, he whispered, standing up. I know what you mean, Tony agreed, standing next to him. But if I had to be anywhere, this is right where I'd want to be. Everyone climbed out of the rowboat, everyone except Q. He was still standing in the boat, looking down at the big gray socks that Matt had tucked into the old shoes. Q, Matt called from the shore. What's wrong? They're his socks, Q replied. Don't you think it's kind of criminal to leave his socks out here, he asked with a pain look on his face. We can't take them with us, Matt told him. Can you imagine trying to explain them to my mother? But they were once on the feet of the father of our country. They should be treated with respect, Q pleaded. And just who was it that you had in mind to show them all this respect, Matt smiled. Me, me, Q cried. I could show them the utmost respect by keeping them in my own private museum, in my bedroom. Wouldn't your mother want to know where they came from, Tony asked. No, she's given up trying to figure out where I get all my stuff from. My bone specimens and white mice scare my mom so much that she won't come in my room at all anymore, except to change the sheets on my bed. No one will ever suspect anything, I promise, he pleaded. It's not up to me, Matt told him, looking over to his little sister. Katie, Q wants to know if you'll let him have George Washington socks. You can't wear them home, so you might as well let him have them, Matt told her. Katie took a long look at the socks in Q's hand, and then she looked up into his eyes. I'll trade them, she said, giving one of her curls a twist. Sure, Q speak with delight. Anything you want. You can have the socks if you buy me my own bag of marshmallows, Katie demanded. You want to trade George Washington socks for a bag of marshmallows, Q asked, his mouth dropping open in disbelief. Katie nodded, her red curls bouncing on her head in the early morning light. Everyone helped to drag the old rowboat across the shore and up into the woods. They found some dense bushes that made a perfect cover. When Matt was sure that the boat was safely hidden, he ordered the hike back to Tony's backyard. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get back to your house, Tony asked Hooter, who was walking in front of him. I'm going to knock on the door and ask my parents to empty the refrigerator, Hooter told him. I do it myself, but I want to save all my energy for he for eating, Hooter laughed. I'll just have them shovel all the food out. The first thing that I'm going to do, Tony said dreamily, is go up to my bathroom and soak in a nice hot tub. And when I get out, I'll have a big soft towels and clean clothes. The first thing that I'm going to do when I get home is to frame George Washington's socks, Q said happily. I'll hang them in a place of reverence over my antique snakeskin collection. What about you, Matt? What's the first thing that you're going to do when you get home, Hooter wanted to know. The first thing I'm going to do is read a book, Matt said with a smile. Read a book, Hooter frowned. Which book, Tony asked suspiciously. Adventures in History, Matt grinned. This was followed by a chorus of groans from Tony, Hooter, and Q. Oh, don't worry, Matt told his fellow club members. If I find anything interesting in it, I'll invite all of you for the next trip. Matt, you aren't serious, Tony asked. You can't mean that you'd really want to do this again. Not right away, Matt shook his head. But someday. Everyone groaned at his suggestion. But you have to admit, Matt whispered, that it was an incredible adventure. I know I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the general's voice or Israel's face or Mr. Hornby, or Black Jack, or Gustav, Hooter added, the smile suddenly leaving his face, or the Indians, Tony whispered, or the baby ducks and the beaver, Katie piped in, or George Washington socks, Q sighed, holding the thick gray socks to his heart. Chapter 23 Home sweet home were the only words on Matt's mind as he walked into his bedroom. He felt the warm, lush carpet between his toes and smiled at the sight of his big, comfortable bed. He reached in his backpack, pulling out the thick green book, Adventures in History. As Matt began to turn the pages, he found himself distracted. His eyes began drifting around the room, finally coming to rest on the silent air conditioner that sat in one of his windows. He walked over to the air conditioner and turned it on full blast. Its soft hum was music to his ears. And what about music? Matt grinned and placed a tape in his tape deck and turned up the volume. Everything sounded and felt so good. Suddenly, he remembered his reading lamp. He reached over to the wall and flipped the lamp switch. When the light came on, Matt whooped with joy. He felt a thrill of excitement as he turned on his clock radio. He even set the alarm to go off. NTV, Matt cried, racing over to his television set. 
I'm going to watch TV. By the time Mrs. Carlson appeared in the doorway, Matt was sitting on his bed reading after turning on every electrical appliance in his room. What on earth is going on in here? His mother called over the din. Matt looked up from his book and grinned. I was just checking to make sure that everything still works, he told her. Mrs. Carlton shook her head. Come and get yourself some breakfast, she told Matt, and for heaven's sakes, take a bath and change your clothes. As she walked away, Matt could hear her mumble under her breath. The way that boy looks after a simple backyard camping trip, you'd think he was just through a war. That night at the supper table, Matt took a seat across from Katie. Before he could stop her, Katie reached for the sugar bowl and opened the lid. The corner of her lips turned up as a smile slowly spread across her face. She dipped two of her little fingers into the bowl, touching the sugary green peas that were still there. Katie, stop that right now. Put the sugar bowl down and finish your supper, Mrs. Carlton said on her way to the table. Matt watched as Katie made a face and reluctantly put the lid back on the sugar bowl. Mr. Carlton was anxious to hear about the camp out. So how was your adventure, he asked. Anything exciting to report? Matt shot Katie a look as she was about to reply. We have to keep the club meetings a secret, Matt answered before Katie could say anything. Well, they must have had some excitement, Mrs. Carlton said, shaking her head. Their clothes were in shreds. Where were Tony's parents? Weren't there any grown-ups looking after you? Just the general, Katie said truthfully. The general? Mr. Carlton looked suspicious. Matt groaned and closed his eyes. General George Washington, Katie grinned. He even gave me his socks. Mr. and Mrs. Carlton looked over to Matt, waiting for an explanation. I should have known that she wouldn't be able to keep a secret, Matt thought as he sat squirming in his chair. Now I'll have to tell them everything. The truth is, he began, we were sitting around the campfire, reading this book about George Washington and the Revolutionary War, and... I remember doing the same kind of thing when I was a boy, Mr. Carlton interrupted. He sat back in his chair and smiled. We would pretend that we were actually living in different times as if we were really there. It's a great way to use your imagination. So where are you planning for the club's next adventure, he asked. Well, I'm not sure, Matt stammered. I've got to do some reading first. So you ended up with George Washington socks, did you, Mr. Carlton smiled over at Katie? Weren't they a little big for you? They were real big, Katie told him, so I traded them for some marshmallows. Well, that was a good trade. I probably would have done the same thing, Mr. Carlton looked over to Matt and winked. And guess what, Dad, Katie cried. I'm a club member now, too, because I found the boat. Boat, Mrs. Carlton's eyebrow shut up. Oh, Matt, you didn't go anywhere near the lake, did you? You do realize how dangerous it is to play there without supervision. She turned to her husband. John, I told you they were too young for a camp out. And one of the soldiers, Katie continued, the nice one who saved me from the freezing ice hole, he got killed. But George Washington, he didn't get killed. What a wonderful imagination the child has, Mr. Carlton beamed at Katie. Franny, you worry too much. They were just pretending, like all kids do. Well, maybe you're right, Mrs. Carlton sighed. She looked at Matt and smiled. So which one of you is pretending to be George Washington, she asked. Uh, well, Matt hesitated. Honey, I don't think Matt wants to divulge any more information. Mr. Carlton turned to Matt and whispered, Private club business, right, son? Something like that, Matt replied. Don't worry, your secret is safe with me, man to man, Mr. Carlton nodded. You did a fine job of looking out for your sister on this camp out, and I want you to know that I'm proud of you for including her. It shows that you're becoming a mature, responsible person. Uh, gee, thanks, Dad, Matt mumbled. Don't mention it, Mr. Carlton smiled. Pass me the sugar, will you, son? The end.